But we continue with our series and actually conclude with this part of the Easter series. We're going to continue with some more thoughts on the resurrection over the next few weeks. But today we, we conclude with the power of the cross. And I've entitled the message this morning, The Victory of the Cross. The Victory of the Cross. We've taken the reading from John chapter 20. That's a very important reading for this message. We're also now going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And want to read from verse 1 to 19 as we consider the victory of the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, reading from verse 1 to 19. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Kephas, then by the twelve, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the great part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I'm the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life we only have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Without the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no Christianity. And our faith is in vain and our faith is only imaginary. Our faith means nothing without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the cornerstone of the Christian faith and of our faith. Without the resurrection, Christ is not who he claimed to be and is not who he says he is. The cross means nothing, and we are all still in our sins. We have no hope in this life, and we have no hope in the next. There is no hope for the poor. There is no hope for the dis disabled. There's no hope for the abused. There's no hope for the mistreated. There's no hope for the victim of crime. There is no hope for the sinner. There is just no hope. It is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that the Christian has hope. It is this resurrection that makes life worth living. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that brings life to every single person, that brings hope to every single person. Every single person that confesses the Lord Jesus Christ has hope. W.J. Sparrow Simpson said the following, if the resurrection is not historic, a historic fact, then the power of death remains unbroken and with it the effect of sin, and the significance of Christ's death remains uncertified, and accordingly believers are yet in their sins, precisely where they were before they heard the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ on 20 occasions in the Gospels said that he would rise from the dead. 
And this is where the challenge is. This is where the rubber hits the road. Because it is on the resurrection that Christianity stands or falls. If the resurrection is not true, we have no hope and we only have but a religion and we're actually wasting our time on a Sunday because there are a lot better things to do than being here. But we are here because Jesus Christ died and he rose again. If someone does not believe in the resurrection, that is an issue and that is a place where they are. But if you don't believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not saved and you're not a Christian because the gospel is directly linked with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if we don't believe in the resurrection, we need to go and find out if the res resurrection is true because any person who claims to be a Christian that does not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ does not believe in the Bible, does not believe in the gospel and is not saved. And that is why the resurrection is a big issue, because without the resurrection, we don't have the cross. And all the things in our world of progressive uh, Christianity, are what's claimed to be progressive, which is actually regressive, but that's another conversation on its own. All of these things are serious issues. The creation is a serious issue. Marriage between a man and a woman is a serious issue. Why are these serious issues? Because we're wanting to fight against the culture? No, because... Jesus Christ spoke of Adam and Eve. Jesus Christ spoke of marriage between, being between a man and a woman. Jesus Christ spoke of his death, and Jesus Christ spoke of his resurrection. All of these things are linked with his character, with his nature, and is the very foundation of the gospel, because the very foundation of the gospel is the credibility of Jesus Christ. So without the credibility of Jesus Christ and his word, we have no Christianity. How do you trust the cross then? When Jesus says, it is finished, why is it finished? Because he said so. His credibility is at stake in this issue. And therefore, the resurrection is vital. And what's so amazing about how God works, this is what I love about how God works, really. He gives you just enough to believe, but it's not always perfectly clear. And I love that because that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So we have enough in the scriptures to prove that Jesus Christ rose from the dead based upon the credibility of scripture. But I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. I wasn't waiting next to the tomb. So I don't know. I haven't held Jesus in my hands. I haven't eaten with him. I didn't touch the nail prints or his side. The whole basis of the Christian faith is on the credibility of Scripture. And this is the problem we face in our world. Because when we attack the Bible, the whole gospel falls apart. So you cannot be part of Christianity and start undermining the word of God. Because the whole thing will fall apart like a pack of cards. Therefore, the Bible is all true. It has to be. Otherwise, we have nothing. So there are a few things I want to share with you, especially just on this day. We don't always do this, but just a bit of apologetics of evidence for the resurrection. There are six things I want to mention to why I believe the resurrection to be true based on God's word. And I just leave this with you to think about and to, to mull over. So the first is Mary. Mary Magdalene. The first is Mary. I just said Mary. I don't want to go into her history, but you know, the Bible never says she's a prostitute, by the way. The Bible only says she was demon-possessed. It never says she was a prostitute. So once again, the poor lady gets a bad rep for something that the Bible doesn't even say. You'd be horrified if it happened to you. But of course, the Bible says that Mary Magdalene, according to John chapter 20, went to the tomb. But she wasn't alone. Of course, the Bible says that there were other Marys with her, quite a few Marys. Can you imagine? Mary, who? Mary, Mary, Mary. And of course, it wouldn't be Mary. Because, of course, Miriam among us would love it. it just, they would have said Miriam, because that's what Mary is. But let's just focus on Mary Magdalene. So she goes down to the tomb. Now, how do I know the Bible is true? Because if you want to hoodwink people, you never 
ever use a woman in the first century to be the testimony. Never. Because in the first century, a woman's testimony did not count as much as a man's. If you've got an issue with that, go back 2,000 years and try and deal with that. I'm not dealing with that. I'm just saying that's true. There's no way, if the Bible was trying to just write itself to try and uh, hoodwink people or deceive people or trying to prove something that doesn't really happen, you don't use the woman to be the first witness of the resurrection. But that's what I love about the Bible, because God just tells it how it happened. Doesn't care about what our cultural references or frameworks are. So one of the evidences to the resurrection is the fact that Mary is the first witness. You don't build the foundation of Christianity on the testimony of a woman in the first century. But God just does that. And he's like, this is what happened. So Mary is the key one. If the Bible was written many years after and people got together to now create this deceptive document, you're going to go, no, it was actually Mark not Mary, just change that and make it Mark because we're not going to use Mary. So Mary is a key evidence to the resurrection. Secondly, the tomb. The tomb is very important. There's, there are two brilliant books written. I'll just leave this with you to think about for those who, who question certain things, for some people who might doubt. There are two brilliant books on evidence to Christianity. The first is Frank Morrison, who wrote the book, Who Moved the Stone? It's the first one. The second one is the greatest manual on Christian apologetics, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. So Evidence That Demands a Verdict and Who Moved the Stone are the two greatest evidences put together. I mean, F.F. F. Bruce is also fantastic, but those two are, are two very important ones. So if you want to know more about the tomb and about the stone, read Frank Morrison, Who Moved the Stone. But I just want to share a few things about the tomb itself and the stone. Firstly, the stone was about two tons. And what would have happened is they would have had a groove and the stone would be pushed down a groove to cover the entrance of the tomb. And what they would do is with two or three people have to push the stone slightly as to the side so you can sneak in and do some work in there. So in the scriptures, the women were concerned about who's going to move the stone for them because it's so heavy. And it's very important. When you look in John chapter 20, if you just turn with me there, So in John chapter 20, you look at verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, of course, Mary, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken or had been taken away from the tomb. The word taken away there in the Greek is a word called ero. And what it basically means is that the stone wasn't just moved. It was removed. So basically a two-ton stone in the first century looked like it was taken, almost lifted, and shifted in such a way that when they came to the tomb, they knew that people didn't just roll it away. And you look throughout the, all four Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what's beautiful about the stone, progressively it moves to, the, to, to a, a place to tell you why it was a testimony. So Mark would say it was moved, and you know, Luke would say it was moved, and Mark says it was moved, and then... Matthew's like, oh, it was moved. And then John tells you how far it was moved. And basically, when they got there, the stone was in such a way that they knew that something miraculous had happened. Because it was two tons. So when they came to the tomb, the evidence for the resurrection is the way that the stone was moved. Some believe, I don't have specific evidence for this, but some believe that because of the way the tombs were, and especially because of Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, which is a new tomb, that they would have had a downhill slant pushing the stone down is all new there that some people believe that it was pushed in such a way that it literally was pushed uphill. So when they got there, it was like, what had happened here? Because the Bible says, who moved the stone? So when Frank Morrison writes, who moved the stone? The Bible says the angels moved the stone. And it's not going to be like, oh, Michael, oh, come help. Oh, Gabriel, you're always moaning. You're such a mouthpiece. Um, you know, <laughs> And then the angels were like, oh, it's hard work, you know? And then you've got another angel coming with a forklift. No. It was literally like, move it. So the tomb was a testimony. The seal was broken. 
The soldiers were gone and the stone was flung away from the entrance of the tomb. Thirdly, the third evidence to the, to the resurrection is the grave clothes. Let's look at John chapter 20. So when you turn again with me to John chapter 20, we're going to read from verse 6 to 8. And we're just going on what the Bible says here. I'm not trying to deal with all rationale and things. I'm just looking at what the text is saying. It says here in verse 6, Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. What's interesting is when you read before that, they both ran to the tomb, but um, John outran Peter because John was young. He was fit. I can imagine Peter running and then getting, oh, it's a stitch. It's a stitch. And there's, there's John going. So, of course, it says Simon Peter came to the tomb following him and went to the tomb. And there he saw the linen cloth lying there. So that's important. So we see the, the grave clothes. But look at what it says. I know that some people might get emotional. But we are here today to say the Shroud of Turin is not true. And I know it's awkward. Some people are going to feel it. I don't really care. But some people feel it. Because the text tells us the Shroud of Turin is not true. Because listen to the text. And the handkerchief that had been around his... What's, what, what, how does the Shroud of Turin look? It's a whole body. And the handkerchief that was around his head, not lying where? With the linen cloths, but folded together in, in a place by itself. So what you have is you've got the grave clothes and the headpiece there. Shroud of Turin can't be true. I know. I know, it's awkward. It's tough. If you're really invested in that, that's fine. I wouldn't trust the Catholic Church with relics as far as I can throw them. It says, then the other disciple who came into the tomb first went in also, and he saw and he believed. Now, that's his key. So basically, when they come in, they see the linen clothes that was around the body that side. They see the headpiece on the other side. And it says that, of course, it's amazing because John went and just saw but didn't go in. Peter, of course, being, you know, Peter, I just go in. I don't really care. I just chop a guy's ears off and I run onto the water. I'm crazy. I'm a madman. Runs in, looks and he sees and he believes. So this is what was important. What was so significant about the grave clothes? Because if you steal a body, you can cut the grave clothes and take the body. He comes in, he sees grave clothes are cut, but he saw and he believed. Because what I think probably happened, and this again, it's a probable, it's a theory. You can say, well, it's not true, but let's look at it. Before Jesus went into the tomb, they put some spices on him. The ladies came on that day to continue with the embalming process, but they would have put some spices on. Those spices are put around the body, and it hardens a little bit. So what you would have seen is when they came into the tomb, the grave clothes were in a shape of a body, but no body in it. Does that make sense? So it, was, it wasn't like sort of like hard like this, but it was just sort of semi in a sort of shape. But the body had moved out of the grave clothes without it being cut because Jesus Christ's body is a resurrected body is beyond time and space now how do we know this where were the disciples gathered in the upper room the text tells you all the doors were locked and the windows were closed and Jesus Christ appears on the way on the road to Emmaus Jesus is talking and then suddenly there's somewhere else because his body was beyond time and space now so when Peter saw the grave close, something miraculous had happened. And that was important. And that was a miracle. His body moved out of the, out of the physical in that context. So you have Mary, you have the tomb, you have the grave close. The fourth reason why I believe in the resurrection biblically is the post-resurrection appearances of Christ and the disciples' testimony, which is very, very important. Why? Because Jesus appeared to his disciples, and the Bible says they touched him. If he was a ghost, you don't touch a ghost. But the Bible clearly says the disciples touched him, and they also ate with him, that he had fish with them. Because Jesus Christ's body was beyond the physical, but it still had a physical component to it. So they touched him, and they could eat with him. Also, what's important about the disciples is that they were scared. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, all of them had run away except John because he's young. He's like, okay, well, I'll go. The rest of them all ran away. They were scared. But after the resurrection, they were all prepared to give their lives, and all of them gave their lives except John. It's an amazing testimony with Peter because, as you know, Peter denies the Lord three times. 
And he denies the Lord three times with a little girl and another woman and then some random guy who recognizes his accent. That's before Jesus dies. But after Jesus Christ dies, after the resurrection, Peter meets with Jesus. Then the Bible says in Acts chapter 4 that Peter stands up in front of the Sanhedrin, which are the, the, the Jewish council or the government, who's able to kill him. And they've done that because they killed Jesus and also they killed Stephen. So they would take Peter out in a heartbeat. And the Bible says Peter stands in front of all of them and says to them that you have crucified the Messiah with wicked hands. You've done this. The conviction from this man who was afraid to then standing up and being willing to give his life is a testimony that he saw something and he touched the Lord Jesus Christ and his life changed. Fifth reason, according to the scriptures, is when you turn to 1 Corinthians 15 with me, <laughs> it's good stuff. It's going on so long, this guy. So <laughs> the fifth reason is, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, let's look at verse um, 6 of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, so it says he was seen by Kephas and the twelve, and then he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present, but some have fallen asleep. So there were more than 500 witnesses who saw Jesus Christ alive after his death. If you are in a court of law and there are 500 witnesses, you are done. And what's amazing is that people could have gone to those people. And if they lied, you would have known they've lied. But no one ever said in historical records that the, the, the disciples or the other witnesses were liars. So the witnesses. And then... The sixth reason why I believe in the resurrection biblically is because of the word of God. The Bible declares that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. It is affirmed and confirmed throughout the New Testament and part of the gospel declaration. The Bible is proved to be true and it declares that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Therefore, we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Bodily. So there was this famous lawyer at the end of the sort of beginning of the 18th, sorry, 19th century. His name was Simon Greenleaf. And he says the following. All that Christianity asks of men on this subject is that they would be consistent with themselves. That they would treat its evidences as they treat the evidence of other things. And that they would try and judge its actors and witnesses as they deal with their fellow men when testifying to human affairs and actions in human tribunals. Let the witnesses be compared with themselves, with each other, and with the surrounding facts and the circumstances. Let their testimony be sifted as if it were given in a court of justice on the side of the adverse party. The witnesses being subjected to a rigorous cross examination. The result? it is confidently believed, will be an undoubted conviction of the integrity, ability, and truth. Either the men of Galilee were men of superlative wisdom and extensive knowledge and experience and of a deeper skill and the arts of deception than any and all others before or after them, or they have truly stated the astonishing things which they saw and heard. Why did Christianity grow? Why did Christianity spread the way it did? It wasn't based on a culture. It wasn't based on a specific people. It spread throughout the world because of the testimony of those who saw Jesus alive after he died. So why is this important as we conclude with some final thoughts on this? I want to just highlight the gospel of the resurrection. This is very important because when we speak about the gospel, there are many people today who love the word gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And everyone focuses on the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. The gospel is not just the cross. The gospel is the cross and the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no cross. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel. It's not just about a cross. It's not just about Jesus dying on the cross. It is the resurrection. 
So firstly, the gospel of the resurrection is important because it is the gospel. And firstly, the resurrection must be preached. We must preach it. And it's difficult, yes, because Jesus Christ came back to life after he died. It is not scientifically possible. It's not. But if I live my life on what is scientifically possible, then you wouldn't believe in miracles. And the Bible speaks of miracles. So yes, it is difficult to the rational mind. It is difficult for us to think that the laws of science and of physics was broken. And the fact that Jesus walked on water, the blind saw, the deaf heard, the mute spoke. But if you go throughout history, there are a lot of things that have happened that's beyond human comprehension. The resurrection must be preached and it confirms the cross. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 to 15 is very important. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 to 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with greater and more and greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, the sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purification of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the inter eternal inheritance. Why is this important? Because if you look at the day of atonement in the Old Testament, the priest has to make a sacrifice and then he can enter. Unless the sacrifice is made, he cannot enter. Jesus Christ had to make the sacrifice before he entered, but not entered earth, not entered a temple here, not entered a tabernacle. He had to die to enter the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly presence. And therefore, the gospel is important in relation to the resurrection. Why? Because we cannot say that we are saved from our sins unless we believe in the resurrection. Because without the resurrection, Jesus Christ could not enter into the heavenlies to pay the price consistently for us. Because that's what the Bible says, that he now is our high priest. He couldn't be the high priest on earth. He's only the high priest in heaven. You need the resurrection because it's by the resurrection and, of course, the ascension as well, that Jesus Christ enters into the Holy of Holies in heaven and has paid the price. And that price is consistently paid because his blood is not just every day. It's a once off forever. So the very gospel is based on the resurrection. And therefore, if someone does not believe in the resurrection, we've got a very, very big problem. And that's the problem with liberal Christianity because we're sitting with a big, big problem because they don't believe in the resurrection. Number two, salvation comes through faith in Christ and the resurrection. In the New Testament, the gospel is not shared without the resurrection being part of that process and it's the bodily resurrection of Christ. The bodily resurrection of Christ must be believed because salvation is by faith. It is faith in the cross. It's faith in the person of Christ. It's faith in his death and resurrection. That is what brings salvation, not just believing in Jesus. I mean, just believe in Jesus. What does believing in Jesus mean? A lot of people believe in Jesus. He lived. Yes, he lived. He died. That doesn't save you. It doesn't save you to believe in Jesus. What saves you is to believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice for sin, and that Jesus Christ conquered death. That saves. Not just Jesus in a general sense. So salvation comes through faith in Christ and the resurrection. Thirdly, the death, the burial, and resurrection is the gospel. Now we have it here, of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, because Paul speaks here. And he says that, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, 
and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. Look at Romans 10, verse 9. So Romans 10, verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The gospel message is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message to the world, that Jesus is the Christ. He is who he said he was. He is God in the flesh. He is the only sacrifice for sin, and he also conquered death. Because the resurrection is the confirmation of the gospel message to the world. It's also the authority of the Bible that's at stake and the credibility of Christ. Therefore, it is the gospel. Because the gospel is solely reliant upon the credibility of Jesus Christ and God's word. That's why when the Bible is attacked, we've got a very, very big problem on our hands. Very big problem. Because once you attack the Bible, you attack the very fabric of the gospel. How do you believe that Jesus died for you if you don't believe in the Bible? Because the Bible tells you Jesus died. Fourthly, what's important about the gospel is the witnesses to the gospel. Because you have it here in, in 1 Corinthians 15, you have witnesses to the gospel. Because the disciples and the other apostles witnessed the resurrection and they became witnesses to the gospel. And what's so key about this is if they are liars, the whole New Testament is done. Because who wrote the New Testament? The apostles. So the gospel is intrinsically linked with the testimony of the apostles, the testimony of those who saw him. Because if that is not true, we have no New Testament. Because they wrote it. And they spoke as the Holy Spirit led them to speak. Therefore, the credibility of the Bible is the key to the whole gospel. And therefore, that's the problem that we have as Christians. Once you descend into liberal Christianity that teaches some of the Bible is true and other, is, other parts are not, and it doesn't really matter, it matters. Therefore, we can't budge on the credibility of Scripture. We cannot budge on the authority of God's Word. Because if you budge here, you have no Christianity left. And why are we in the mess we're in? Because the Bible is being undermined. And it starts small, in small little places. And before you know it, you're going down a very, very dangerous place. So the witnesses to the gospel is an important part of the gospel. The apostles witnessed. It's their authority. Number five, gospel of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no Christian faith and also no Christian experience. If you look at Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 5, it's very important what the Christian experience is. And this is not a physical experience. It's a spiritual thing that must happen. And this is a difficult part for us in living in a Judeo-Christian society. Because we have forgotten what conversion is. Among us here today, and some that are not in our church physically today, but are part of our church, there are people here who've come from different places, different countries, who have heard the gospel and they have been saved. They can identify with that was my past and this is my now. But the problem is that many of us grew up in church and we don't have a past. We just have one eternal now of Jesusness. Because we, our parents taught us some Bible stuff. We were in church. It's just the next process and phase. The core of the gospel is conversion. So if you grew up in church, you have to confess the fact that you did not fully believe and understand. And you have to come to the place where you believe and understand. Because the Christian experience in Romans 6 is very specific. Let's look at it in verse 3 to 5. Look at the Christian experience related to the gospel. Firstly, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized, this baptism here has got nothing to do with water. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, that's spiritual. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. 
that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. That is the Christian experience. Every single person who is a Christian has experienced death and life. If you haven't experienced death and life, then you have to ask, what was my Christian experience? Because every single person that confesses Christ identifies with the death of Christ for you and identifies with his resurrection that we have been raised anew, that we have an old self and a new self. And the old self, unfortunately, like the bad uncle that comes to you Christmas and you don't want him always there because it's a bit difficult sometimes. That's your flesh. That's the old self. He's the one that you've got to hide things from and he's a bit awkward at times and it's weird and strange. Maybe you don't have that one, but I've got some family members where it's like, oh, they're coming. All right, not here, but in South Africa. And, and basically that old self, it doesn't go away. It will never go away. It's still there until Christ returns. But we must have an old self and a new self. And every single day I must make the decision in Christ to not live in the old, but live in the new. That's what Romans 6 verse 1 and 2 says. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Why? Because I have been identified spiritually with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the Christian experience. It's not a religion. It's not some rules. It's not being a nice person or wearing a tie or shaving and being put together well. Only speaking male things, but ladies, you know, know, it's it's awkward. I can't talk about dresses and stuff because some, you know, it's just weird. All right. But it's not about how you look or what you do. It is about your identification. And do you identify with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you identify with the cross? Do you identify with his resurrection? Can you identify? It doesn't have to be a day, but a time where you knew that I was raised from the dead. Because that is the gospel. It is our conversion. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 5, as we conclude, is this. It's part of the Christian experience. So Ephesians 4 verse 5 says, I was going to read it from the screen, so it's fine, I'll read it from there. It says, there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That baptism, there's not water. It's identification with Jesus Christ at conversion. But that baptism there is not just about the cross. The baptism there is about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So I pray that each and every one of us, those who are truly living for the Lord, that we will identify with the death, the burial, and resurrection, that we are reminded today that as Christians, we live a new life because of the resurrection of Christ. For those who struggle with faith, for those who might be atheistic or agnostic or, I don't know, just sort of, yeah, don't know. can use a sort of modern term, non-binary in my faith. I don't know where I am. Okay, just sort of like, mm, whatever. Like, could I feel like this? Could I feel like that? Like, anyway, it's weird. Um, if you feel like that, there's one thing I'll share with you finally as we conclude. If you look at all the major religions in the world, all of them are based on some philosophical thought. What's very interesting is that all the religions that are based on a personality, all of those personalities, including Abraham, they are dead and people visit their graves. Christianity is not based on a personality that's in a grave. Christianity is based on the person of Christ, and he rose from the dead. I'm only interested in the one who conquered life and conquered death. I'm not interested in Buddha's philosophy. I'm not interested in um, what anyone else says. I'm only interested in the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the resurrection and the life. That's who we worship, and that's who we are interested in. The greatest enemy of life is death, and Jesus conquered death. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth to us. We thank you for this very special and glorious day. As we gather today, Lord, to declare that 
Jesus Christ is risen. What a blessed statement that is to make. And thank you for that truth. Thank you, Lord, for the foundation of the gospel message that we declare. And the reason why, Lord, because it doesn't make sense for us as human beings to think of a resurrection, to think of something that breaks the rules of science and reason and logic. And that's why it's so amazing, Lord, that we can go out into the world we are not here to convince people. We are not here to debate with them and to try and make them see things because they might not see it. But we are here to declare that message. Lord Jesus, you died, you rose again. That is the gospel message. Our responsibility is only to share it. You then use it and you work in the hearts and minds of people. So we pray, Lord, that you will use us for your honor and glory. You will use us to share the wonderful message to every single person that they can be in a relationship with you, that they can be reconciled to God in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. So help us, Lord, to stand firm. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you continue to do in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we can identify with your death, your burial, your resurrection, that we can live in the newness of life. So thank you, Lord, for what this weekend represents and that we have the privilege of being together today. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please join us as we conclude in song.